class is in session. How is everybody doing? Welcome to Unlearn 16 classes in session episode, I don't know, a cabillion? I feel like I've done a lot, guys. I feel like I've done a lot. But this one is kind of a part two. And not last Tuesday, but the Tuesday prior, I did an episode talking about what it is to be a democratic country. Because we're throwing around the word democracy like people know what they're talking about, and they don't. And they're equating democracy to unlimited freedom, unlimited, like, there should be nothing limiting what I get to do in this democracy that I have, and politicians should do exactly what I stipulate. And all of that's not true. Um, I have a coffee today, so if you hear me taking a sip, that's because I'm really lazy and it's the start of March break. I have a buffy cup if anybody is just listening and they care to know what cup I'm drinking out of. So today, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the limitations of democracies and this notion that not only do we not have unlimited rights, but there are so many things that are getting in the way of a real democracy. And I think we should address them today. And, and I think what's going on all over the world, what's going on with the trucker convoy, the vaccine stuff, the, the mandate stuff, the horrific realities in the Ukraine right now, these are all pushing and leaning towards what it is to be in a democracy and the real significant limits of a democracy. And a lot of people equate democracy and capitalism. And well, I just think that might be fundamentally flawed. I think equating real democracy with capitalism, perhaps you guys are going to all flood my comments with communist propaganda, but I'm not necessarily advocating communism. I'm saying perhaps, maybe, maybe capitalism is getting in the way. And I'm going to give you a lot of examples today. So the first limit of a full democracy. So what this is, nobody on the planet has a full, functional, perfected democracy. Everybody gets that, right? I mean, at the very least, we have a representative democracy. And in that, there's all these inherent flaws. First, I'm going to talk about the probably the biggest limitation, which are the benefits of the rich. So in a way... The more money you have, the more benefit that can be afforded to you in a democracy. And, and since, uh, sorry, in a capitalist system, the more money you have, the more power you have, the more freedom you have. All of that is true. I don't think anybody can actually, you know, disagree with me on the premise that money buys a level of freedom and a level of protection and all of those things. And in a democracy, it shifts where the power lies. So let's go through some of the things that wealthy individuals, and again, I'm not blaming. So before everybody backpedals and says, well, I work hard for my money. Look, it's not about how hard you work. It's not about whether it's deserved or not. It's about the benefits that come with having a full wallet. So number one, under the benefits of the rich, the rich are usually have are usually can be more educated and have much easier access to education and therefore at the very least gives them a better starting point i live in canada and and we have a very very robust for the most part public education system but i work at a private school and that private school is not cheap guys it is not cheap at all and what I often see in that private school, and I love where I work, pay, like make no mistake about it, but what these kids get is they get a leg up. For example, my classrooms go anywhere from 10 to 15 students in a classroom. When you then compare it to the public system, where it's 20 to 30 to 35 kids in a classroom, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to understand that the kid in the smaller classroom with more accountability, with more connection to parents and all of those things that go hand in hand, we all follow the same curriculum. Those kids are getting more attention, right? Those kids are getting more, um, more focused than they could be getting from fantastic teachers in the public board. I'll give you an example. I, I often say, listen, 
kids that are going to get 97s are going to get 97s. It doesn't, you can pretty much put them anywhere. Go ahead and put them anywhere. That's not who I'm talking about. And the kids that hate school and don't want to go and, and drag their heels or go and just avoid it at all costs. Guess what? They're pretty much not going to like it anywhere. Excuse me while I take a sip of my coffee. Again, the Buffy mug. Those kids are going to go, you know, aren't going to be successful anywhere they've decided for whatever their reasons. Now, here's where a private school comes into play. A good private school. By the way, there's a lot of horrible private schools, but a good private school will come into play this way. And these are the legitimate ways. I'm not even talking about the illegitimate ways where money buys you privilege, buys you a call to the dean at Notre Dame or whatever. I'm not even there yet. These are just genuine privileges. The kids that get like 50s to let's say 75s, those kids, the kids that are quiet, the kids that are good, the kids that don't cause much havoc, they get their stuff done, they do it at bare minimum, and they roll through. Either they don't care to be fo focused or they're having problems and legitimate issues in focusing and getting the work done. Those kids will have the best chance of increasing that grade by, I'd say, functionally 15 to 20%. Those kids, the kids that want to change, the kids that want to work hard, they just don't see a path to do so. And they can't get the enough, they can't get enough attention from public school teachers because there's so many kids in that class. And usually that class would have kids that would demand a lot of their attention. So number one, they're the ones that get a better education. Now that's not including the calls that can be made, the the significant sums of money that allow for the calls to be made or whatever. Also, in a democracy, the people with money can run. A lot of people talk about why I don't run. There's lots of reasons that I don't. Um, but an interesting reason is because I can't afford to take a year off of school, a year off of my teaching, in order to direct all my efforts to politics and to getting elected. And uh, the, the kinds of friends that you would need in order to get that campaign properly funded. And this just gets worse the higher up you go. And in the States, it's even worse than here. So that's an incredible limitation, limitation on who can even be involved in a real way in elected government. Now, that is not to say teachers can't be elected, of course, we have a prime minister that has, but look at who else he is. Look at what other support he has outside of his name. Look at the other support that other candidates have, right? And what we've done in essence by limiting who can run based on the money that they can accumulate or the money that they can put towards something, we have really limited the intelligent, passionate, capable people from being able to run if they wanted to, now they don't all want to, but if they wanted to, based on an economic platform. What an incredible limitation. Another limitation to democracy, not everybody can vote. So in Canada, you have to be 18 to vote. We all know this, right? This is the age of majority. You have to be 18 to vote. You have to be 18 to go to war. We're going to make you be 19 till you can drink a beer. I don't quite understand that. But this is the bottom line for us, right? So all of these kids that, by the way, once they get through, let's say, my grade 10 civics, they know more about the political system in Canada and in Ontario than most adults I speak to. No joke. And that's because those kids are being forced into it. Sure, they're being forced to research it. They understand the platforms. They can tell me what the PPC said. They can tell me what Pierre Poliver said. They, they know because I've kind of forced it upon them. <laughs> and that's, you know my job as a teacher, but there's a lot of adults who just vote conservative or vote liberal because it's the way their family voted. It's the way they've always voted. They don't take time, nor do they have to take time to really be educated so they can't vote. If you are homeless in Canada, you cannot vote. Why? Because it doesn't tie you to a riding. And if you're not tied to a riding, now if you're in a shelter pretty consistently, that they can use that as your permanent address. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of people that are sort of taken out of that system and it changes. We're talking about a full democracy, right? 
And don't tell me that these policies don't affect kids because you go down to Florida and hear about the don't say gay bull crap. I was almost going to swear there, but I took control of myself going on in Florida, like all of these policies and who it affects. And these kids were saying these kids aren't political beings. They don't have political rights. They don't, they, they don't get the power to decide who creates, conforms, manipulates, indoctrinates their curriculum. That's a limitation to democracy. Number three, and guys, this is a big one. This is a big one. Companies, multinational, transnational corporations. Now, we have seen this time and time and time again, but these are the companies that give huge sums of donations to political powerhouses, huge sums. These interest groups can technically have access to the government at all turns, donating millions of dollars. Now there are limits, sure, but let's be honest. We all find ways around those limitations, right? There's always other people that can donate for us. And what it does is it puts your issue, your pressure, your um, particular political perspective on the top of the block, right? There's a reason the NRA, NRA is so incredibly powerful because they have a boatload of money. Now, some people would say, listen, Joanna, but the NRA has a boatload of money because there's a lot of Americans supporting the NRA and what they stand for. And I get it. I get it. So there is that aspect to it. But what about oil companies? What about the massive, massive political uh, power that these oil companies wield? And as we've been seeing, if we're going to talk about Russia and the Ukraine, sorry, Ukraine, I say the Ukraine, that is completely unacceptable. And I'm trying very, very hard to work myself around it. Between Russia and Ukraine, obviously, the political and economic power of an oil company can move mountains. You want to know why we haven't shifted anything significant? I don't think you have to look far. You really want to be an environmental organization or you want to be an environmental politician that's going to transform all of this? You're coming up against some of the biggest, deepest pockets on the political stage right now. And that's a limitation, right? Now, can these people represent parts of the American or Canadian public? Of course they can. Of course they can. But the notion that it's the, the average voter really gets taken out of context, right? Another problem, this one's going to get a little complicated. Elections don't always represent the public. We know this. And I'm, for the love of all that's holy, not talking about Trump and the election's fraudulent. I'm talking about fundamentally the way elections work. There is always a difference, both in the United States and Canada, between the public vote, the popular vote, and the actual power the politician gets at the end of the day. So in the United States, you will always have how many electoral college votes did the president get and how, many, uh, and how much of the popular vote did they get. And those don't always match. There's been many a president that hasn't won the popular vote yet become president. And a lot of people are like, I don't understand how that could happen. Well, it happens because different states have different populations. And those states were granted power or electoral college votes based on their population. And here's the key and how much money they brought into the union. The United States have never, ever made any bones about the fact they believe that the more money you have, the greater stake you have in America's success and the greater power you should have in their democratic reforms and principles. Now, Canada is a little bit different. We didn't necessarily come to the same conclusion, but we have a similar outset of a problem. I'll give you an example and try to I don't know. I should have drawn something here. Maybe had a blackboard behind me, but I didn't. So here's how it works in Canada. In Canada, we have 338 ridings. They're all divided up. Each riding represents about 150, 200,000 people. If I win riding A, 
and there's, let's say, four other parties running, I don't necessarily need to win a majority of those votes. I just need to win more votes than any of the other four parties. Are you with me so far? So technically, I can win a riding with 25% of the vote, technically. Now, if my party did that over half, half, just over half of the ridings, and at every turn, my party just wins by the skin of their teeth at 25, 26, 27 percent of the popular vote in that riding, but we all win the seats, we all go to the House of Commons, and my the the second party, and I know I'm I'm simplifying this, but the party that came in second, they win just under half of those seats, but every time they win. They win with 55, 60% of the popular vote in that riding. They could have, in essence, gotten twice as many votes in Canada as I did, yet my party gets to form government and I get to be the prime minister. So there's flaws in the system. So a lot of people have advocated in Canada, there should be, you know, it shouldn't be based on riding. It should be based on proportionality. So if my party gets 52% of the popular vote, that's how many seats I get. Here's the problem. Israel has this, and there's at least 26 major parties. So they all end up splitting the vote. And what happens is there's a lot of coalitions that form, and who I voted for doesn't necessarily, nothing comes to fruition anyways. So there's problems there. Um, A lot more people believe that there should be a preferential ballot system, a ranking system, if you will. So if I have four parties running in my riding, I then rank them one through four, and then it's averaged out, right? So what it's taking it into account is people that are loved but hated equally so that the party that we get at the end of the day is a little bit more reflective of everybody that's in the country. Here's another big one. And this is the one, oh my, we're coming to terms with right now. We really, really are. We cannot cope. We cannot legislate, we cannot democratize globalization. So right now, guys, we're seeing, I don't know what it is in the States, but in Canada, we're seeing a huge rise in gas prices. Now, it's not all because of what's going on in Russia, but a big chunk of it is. And and the reality is, is that as countries now, our economies are intricately linked with many, many, many countries. So a ripple in Russia or China or Germany, or they all have catast- or they can have catastrophic effects all the way around. So when I get elected in Canada as prime minister, let's say, I've promised you 10 things. And all of a sudden there's a war in Russia, or there's a there's a aggressive attacking of Russia and attacking Ukraine. And now gas prices go through the roof. I have to make huge economic decisions in order to manage that situation. And those 10 things that I promised are all of a sudden off the table because I can't do them anymore because I got to redirect. Our economies are so intricately connected and our militaries, we're all talking about NATO, are so connected That for me to sit here and say, Canada as a country, I can control it. We are sovereign is a flat out lie. Just a flat, we are not sovereign. And we have proved that time and time again, both with the economy, with the environment, with viral transmissions, time and time and time again, we prove that the notion of democracy as it runs Canada is flawed, is inherently flawed in this new democratic order, or sorry, in this new globalized order. And a lot of people are having problems with this, right? They're, they're, they're so upset at globalization. They're so upset at this idea of a global world order. And they're, they're advocately, sorry, they're, they're in, in, you know, angrily against it, right? They're talking about the world economic forum and all of these big powerhouses. It, guys, it's already here. It's already here. It's why you have Kiwis in December. It's why all of your shirts come from Bangladesh. It's why our oil is coming from Saudi Arabia, Russia, and Venezuela. Look, it's already here. It's not new. You just have had politicians pretending as though we can control it. 
We can limit it. We can't. If we want our economies intricately linked with other countries, this is the new order of capitalism. Do I have problems with it? Of course I do. Of course I do. But I don't know if that's a democratic problem. I think it's a capitalist problem. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, and the biggest problem here, a lot of people are like, who goes to war and who doesn't go to war? And how do we decide all these things? Because in a globalized world, I don't elect who runs the United Nations. I don't elect NATO. I don't elect these. And we don't have any supra. That's not super, but supra meaning above. We don't elect these above ranking um, politicians that are making these choices. And yet we are. Right. What we've done is we've elected a prime minister or a president, depending on your system, that is going to make choices internationally. But those international choices, they're just one of many. So that idea of sovereignty or that idea of control is much, much less than we think it should be or it actually is. Trudeau or any Biden in the United States, any of these people don't have nearly the control over state politics as we once thought they did. And we've been, by the way, and it doesn't matter who you are, because any, by the way, anybody saying, oh, well, we should be more isolationist or free trade is garbage. or Those were all conservatives pushing that as well as liberals, right? NAFTA, you had Brian Mulroney on our side of the fence and you guys all had, had Reagan down there. That's who sat down and negotiated that. Don't forget that. I'm not blaming a party. I just think it's hysterical that we get to this point and you start hearing Republicans saying, let's make America great again. Great to win. By the way, it was your it was also your party who forged ahead when it was going to benefit you. Right. But when we enter into these international agreements, they might benefit us. They might not. It depends how the tide turns. Also, in a democracy, we're supposed to not discriminate. Right. In a democracy, you're supposed to have the right to vote, but your right to vote and your freedom isn't supposed to intrude or infringe on somebody else's. And this is where we've really, really stepped in it in every country I could even possibly imagine, because the majority have utilized their power and their strength and their money to consistently oppress the minority. And whether that minority be women be a racial minority, be a sexual minority, be a trans, it doesn't really seem to matter, be a class minority. Who? why don't we talk about that one a little bit more? It doesn't seem to matter. Discrimination and abuse of that system is pretty consistent. And again, my mind goes to capitalism. My mind goes to what can we buy and how can we manipulate the system to get what we want? When you have a guy like Elon Musk, and I know everybody, I've seen pictures of him dressed up like Captain America. First of all, if Elon Musk was going to be an Avenger, he's Iron Man. Let's be honest. And unless an Iron Man has the whole other Avengers keeping him in line, what happens to Iron Man? It doesn't go well. He's no Captain America. and But you got have a guy like Elon Musk. Think about what just happened with Russia. Sorry, more coffee. What just happened with Russia is Elon Musk decided, and here's the scary part, that he was going to repurpose Starlink satellites to benefit Ukraine in this war. Now, everybody champions Elon Musk, right? What an amazing thing he just did. That's great. And he did. Right? It was an amazing thing. It was a great choice. Here's the problem. And we go back to the Avengers, guys. We really, really true. It's amazing what you can learn from Marvel. What happens when he makes a decision that doesn't benefit the right side, the moral side, the ethical side? What happens when it's just a decision that benefits Elon Musk's side or who's he's what what we've done by by allowing such a mass accumulation and i mean mass accumulation of wealth 
Speaking of oligarchs, and I know we love to point to them in Russia, but speaking of oligarchs, we've give them, we've allowed these individuals through proper channels of capitalism, such incredible wealth that one man gets to decide where his satellites are repurposed. Where's the democracy in that? What happened to my vote there? What happened to the majority rule and debate and discussion? What happened there? And again, did I like the decision? Musk made sure. Am I going to always? Eventually, a guy like that builds AI and it almost destroys the world. Like it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the inherent flaws in that kind of wealth. And over the last 10 years, guys, that kind of wealth, maybe even over the last, 2008 was probably a pretty big marker. 2008, a bunch of people got super, super, super rich betting against mortgage rates, betting against people keeping their house. And you saw their income go through the roof. And over these past few years with COVID and everybody's struggling and struggling and struggling, somehow major corporations and billionaires just accumulate, accumulate, and accumulate. And you guys can go check out those numbers. I'm not going to read them off here. There's no point. It's a fact. So in that mass accumulation, what has it done to democracy? Where's the union? Where's the balance? Where is the balance of that kind of economic power and the worker power that allowed for it to happen? Where is it? Because I don't see it. I don't see it. And the reason why those companies will pay their workers well isn't just to be good guys, it's to keep a union out. It's to keep a union out because we know that that's going to balance my, you know, that's going to mitigate or balance or, or create some sort of deficit on my power. Hundreds of billions of dollars, one man deciding to repurpose his, not his Bentley, his satellite to be used in a war. That's a hell of a lot of power that has no oversight, that has no democratic principles. And that's the output and the end result of capitalism. So when people all the time, and I know you guys have heard this probably when you were kids in school, right? All the time you'd hear dictatorship and communism and capitalism and, and democracy. And somehow capitalism and democracy have to go hand in hand. The freedom of capitalism and the freedom of democracy, those go hand in hand, but nobody's talking about the aftermath of that. Nobody's talking about the end of capitalism. And I really think we're somewhere, we're after capitalism. Where's the fair competition? Who's competing with Amazon? Where's the fair competition? We have monopolies left, right, and center. We have oligarchs guys worth hundreds of billions of dollars. We've never seen this disparity of wealth in a very long time. We have this weird kind of post-capitalistic feudalism where certain people have become self-appointed kings and queens. This doesn't necessarily have to have a sexist underpinning, but it seems that a lot of men are the ones becoming billionaires. All of this, all of this reality limits freedom. You want to talk about real limits of freedom? It's not because you had to scan something to get into a restaurant, make sure you had a vaccine passport. Real limits of freedom in a place where money buys power is who gets to limit your money. Who controls, who gets paid what, how much they get, where they do business with which countries they do business with, which peoples they take advantage of. And by the way, guys, we've stood up for our people, right? That we have all these environmental labor standards going in Canada and the United States. We, for our, our labor force, we have workers' rights. We have health rights of all of our workers. And what's happened? 
All of these businesses have been allowed to pick up and go somewhere else and take advantage of a country that is poor and desperate and willing to do whatever it takes to have the company there. It's how we get our $5 t-shirts. We get our $5 t-shirts because they've outsourced that labor. And when we get angry about where we've outsourced it, outsourced it don't, don't. These are people that are so desperate, they'll, they'll do anything to get paid, even if it's next to nothing. Who's making money on that? It's not me. It's not you, unless, you know, Elon's listening to this right now, or Bezos is listening to this right now. It is these major corporations that are making money on the cheap labor. My question is, how much money do we need to make, folks? The United States love to talk, uh, politicians love to talk about how horrible immigra uh, illegal immigration is into the United States, how awful it is. All these people sneaking across the border and working illegally. Who are they working for? Who are they working for? Republican Party? I'll tell you who they're working for. They're working for companies like Tyson. Tyson is a huge meat company, a lot of chicken, holiday ham. They consistently hire illegal immigrants coming from Mexico in order to utilize cheap, scared, disempowered labor. And every once in a while, ICE will swoop in and arrest a bunch of them all as being illegals and send them all back to Mexico and do their job. And Tyson just gets a whole new recruiting process going. You want to end illegal immigration? It's not a it's not a democracy issue. It's not a it, it is a human rights issue. But if you want to end it, every time a company's caught hiring an illegal immigrant because they're always doing it for their purpose, charge that company one hundred fifty thousand dollars a person. How about charge that com company two hundred thousand dollars a person? Force that company to then pay for their immigration status. That's an even better one. I like this better because it actually takes care of the person that was willing to risk life and limb to have a job and feed his family or her family. How about this? Tyson gets caught with an immigrant. Great. An illegal immigrant. Tyson, you now pay that person $200,000 and, and you sponsor them to get legal worker status in the United States of America. How about that? You want to see illegal immigration end tomorrow? Why do we keep punishing the weak and the poor for what the powerful and the wealthy, and I don't mean Dr. Wealthy, I mean oligarch wealthy. I mean that guy in Russia that has the $800 million boat, that guy. I mean the guy that has his own satellite. Guys, I just, we, we kind of assume that it's okay. We, we all watched Iron Man and didn't really think it was possible. I'm waiting for Elon's suit. And if he had any courage, maybe he already would have made one, but he's not that kind. He hasn't been trapped in a bunker yet. But these limits on our freedoms are significant, right? You step out of line, who gets to silence you? I don't worry as much about my government than I do about people with money. We talk about the media all the time. All the time we talk about the media and how horrible the media is, right? Awful. If I hear the words legacy media from, from what's his face, Jordan Peterson, one more time. Well, where do you want your media to come from? I get it. I get it. We do not want it coming from a handful of, of massive corporations that could get to control the narrative, right? But where else do we get it? Do we get it from small companies emerging and then trusting them? How easy do you think it is to buy the small company? We still live in a capitalist system. You're, you just want to shove more media into a broken system. I advocated the other day that we should have a fully funded, um, fully funded public 
media system. And in Canada, it's the CBC. And everybody hates the CBC because they're so hard on conservatives. I think they're so hard on conservatives because conservatives have been wrong a lot lately. But how about we fully fund the CBC, but we don't make it contingent upon the government that's in power that day? I'm not saying it should be our only media, but how about that's one aspect? How about no matter who gets elected, that funding stays consistent? How about we appoint different uh, governmental or agencies, get to appoint them just like to the Supreme Court? If we can appoint the Supreme Court and call it fair and impartial, for the most part, unless people are way off the hill, how can we not do the same thing for a media agency to be run by the government? And I'm not doing it to the exclusion of everybody else. Everybody's talking about bias. Of course, there's bias. Jordan. There's by, of course, stop assuming that there isn't, but please, for the all that's holy, stop saying A, B, and C are bias, but the one I listen to, now they're bang on. No bias there. Nobody can buy them off. In an age of capitalism, everybody seems to have a price. And the more money you accumulate, the more power you can wield. And if that's true, if that's true, there's the fundamental flaw in democracy. The thing we were told as a kid that went hand in hand, democracy and capitalism, capitalism in the stage we're in right now, there's the flaw. There's the problem. Now what? People are talking about an oligarchy of the wealthy in Russia. Of course there is. Oh, but guys, let's not pretend there isn't here. What about the Westons? By the way, my American people, the Westons are a huge Canadian family. They own Shoppers Drug Mart and Loblaws. It's a it's a massive conglomerate, right? Huge, huge power. We have Rogers Media. It's our version of Halliburton. You all make you know missiles. We just make bad TV. The oligarchy of the wealthy is incredibly powerful. It manipulates everything from who controls the satellites to what lawyers I can buy. In a system that's based on rule of law, that's a fundamental principle of democracy. Yet the more money you have, the more lawyers you can buy, it changes the system, the fundamental premise of democracy. It shatters it into a million pieces. If I can buy eight lawyer, lawyers, OJ Simpson, changes democracy. It changes the rule of law. Even better, if I can pick up the phone and call somebody and have something changed. How much do we think that happens? Who has any idea? It happens right now, and now, and now. In that system, when money can buy that kind of privilege and that kind of get out of jail free card, literally, what happens to democracy? Right? And that was the whole conversation about where money comes from and how money filters into a country and what it does and who it pressures. Because all of that, all of that money, that's why everybody's talking about cryptocurrency, all that money does is advocates and allows for power. In a capitalist system, money is power. And what is power? The ability for me to exert my will over others. And if that's true, and that's what power is, then in a capitalist or a post-capitalist system where we have incredibly imbalanced these, these increases in the accumulation of billions of dollars in the hands of so few, we've broken democracy. And I don't think it's an undersell. I don't think, I don't think I can stress on it enough that the more we see this happening, and the more power lands in the hands of the few. Now I see lots of balances in the world. I feel, I feel like the internet is really a great balance to that. 
in a lot of ways. But in, fl- in, in other ways, the more money, it, it's funny, we have all this freedom, but we're still all drawn to the right, you know, the right sites. I didn't mean that politically, but we're all drawn to the sites that can afford the advertising and the promotion, right? The right podcasts, the right um, YouTube videos. All of that requires money in advertising. It is no different. It is no different, actually, than what makes a great song a lot of the time. What makes a great song? Well, that Sony just dropped $1.1 billion pushing out the new Justin song. I love you, Justin, but you get my point. What about the song that didn't get pushed? Was it a better song? Would more people have loved it? Who will ever freaking know? And music might feel like a, like, you know, a minimal example. Like it doesn't matter. Superficial. Who cares? But it is a great example of the ideas that get pushed to the top are the ideas that have money and power. And in this capitalist situation, right now, in this time, when we have such a divergence, such a such a difference between those handful of few that have the billions, it's a heck of a lot of power and it's shattering, shattering the way a democracy is supposed to run. And it keeps showing me every day that maybe capitalism and democracy don't go hand in hand, not the way we have it. Not the way we have it. And if I can decide on where to put my satellite, how to repurpose my military grade equipment, I don't know where democracy's gone. And on that Iron Man note, if only he were as good looking as Robert Downey. And on that Iron Man note, Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Go check out my website, guys. It's up and running, unlearn16.ca. You can check out my merch. I'd really appreciate it. Speaking of capitalism, that was a horrible, horrible transition into that, wasn't it? But I'll tell you, I'm not a big company and I don't have billions, so we're all good. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, and I will see you guys next Tuesday. Same bat time, same bat station. Have a great week, guys. Dismissed.